I'm delighted to be here with Miron, with Max. It's a huge privilege and an honor for me. Um, and I hope it's an, it's an amazing conversation for all of us. Um, today we're here to talk about AI. So it, it seems like half the world is talking about AI all the time. Um, but this is not your typical conversation about AI. It's not your typical forum about AI. We found out in recent months that AI can be a window into understanding one's worldview better, to asking questions and finding answers about ethics, morality, even what does being human even mean? And in many ways, that's what Veritas is all about, as Jack has pointed out. So that leads us to the question that we have here tonight. Will AI make us obsolete? And because this is such a huge thing today, I'm here. I mean, it's, it's a fair question. What's a history major doing in a conversation about AI? I mean, I've, I've asked myself that multiple times throughout these past few days. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think the crossroads that we're in affects everyone. And that's why I'm here. So I'm basically here to ask the dumb questions and for you guys to come in with the, with the expertise for us. And maybe in that way we can bridge the gap for the layman as well who wants to know about this new technology that's about to shape our world for the better or for the worst. That's what we're here to, to talk about. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to just briefly sketch out uh, your relationship, your journey with AI for, for, each, for each of you. So maybe let's perhaps start with you, Max. Um, so you're officially a com computational neuroscientist. But at the heart, you're also a Christian. <coughs> many, many people look at these two things, a scientist and a Christian, and they think, well, that seems kind of incompatible to me, you know, and impossible to have a Christian and a scientist. But you, hopefully, don't see it that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so explain to us, how does, how does your Christian faith and your, your journey with science walk together, and especially your journey with AI? How has that Christian worldview um, come into the picture? Okay, great. Yeah, delighted to be here. And it uh, sounds like everyone can hear me too, right? Oh. <clears throat> Good, yeah, so, uh, uh, well, it started in high school, I, I mean, I thought AI yeah, was just really cool, I read a textbook, and then I started studying uh, computer science, actually, in college, and then I realized, well, we try to do AI, but we don't really know what real AI is and how, how that works, and um, so I switched to computational neuroscience, where the idea is you build computer models of how the brain works, and uh, then I did that for grad school at MIT, and um, <clears throat> so I was all like, okay, when we understand the brain, we understand people, right, we understand how people interact, you know, intelligence and whatnot. So, so it was very much a materialist, right? I mean, this is this is all there is, right? And um, uh, and uh, I mean, learned a lot about like three pounds of fat between your ears, right? Doing amazing things. Um, and then I also got married, and I realized, well, there's a lot more to people, and we talked about that over dinner. Right? <laughs> a lot more to people than just uh, like ions flowing uh, between neurons, right? It's uh, I mean, people have feelings, right? They have a feeling of self. They uh, <coughs> I mean, there's consciousness, there's this idea of like values and things like that, and um, all that didn't quite fit with the materialistic worldview, right? I mean, there seems to be something more than that. And, uh, and so, uh, and that's actually how I became uh, a Christian, because there was a worldview that kind of made sense of, of everything, right? I mean, there, there, there's, the, there's the world here, right? But then there's also more to our human existence in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, we, we have a body, we have a mind, right? we have a soul, if you want. Right? And, uh, and so that was then a more satisfying account, and. Uh, it's, uh, um, especially as a scientist, right? I mean, if you think this world is all there is, well, the question is, I mean, how do you know, right? I mean, this is just an assumption you start out making, um, but with what justification? And so then I went to Georgetown, and Georgetown is nice because it doesn't have this kind of axiomatic reductionism that starts out with, well, this world is all there is, but rather, let's have all people from different cultures, different backgrounds, right? And then try to solve these hard problems, try to make sense of the world. and. Um, and so it's been a very fruitful environment. It has like it has these values like pure personalis, like the care for the whole person. So the idea being that people, I mean, there's more to a person than just the, the physical. And um, so that's been very fruitful. Now I co-direct the CNE, where the idea is that we now use technology to treat mental disorders, for instance. And uh, we will have a chance to talk about that later on. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of the, the journey. That's awesome, um, <coughs> Marin. You're you're not a Christian. Um, thanks for being here. Um, but in your Twitter, Twitter bio, you have a very interesting phrase to describe yourself. You say, working on trying to do the right thing with technology. 
So you seem to be acutely aware of the responsibility that either computer scientists or those working with AI directly or with any type of technology have, they have a responsibility to play in how they shape the world. And that seems to be a guiding philosophy for you. How has that guided you in industry, as a researcher, as an educator, um, and throughout your life overall with, with AI as well? That's a great question, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think we have responsibility to each other, like to the extent that we agree that we're going to be part of a society, we're going to take part in kind of this broader picture as opposed to living in isolation. We have responsibilities to each other to say, how do we treat each other in a manner that we would want to be treated, that we think uh, has particular values in it that we might want to uphold, things like fairness, things like justice. And so technology, I think, is an accelerant for many of the things we do in the world. It can be an accelerant for the good or it can be an accelerant for the bad. And technology left unexamined, I think, is actually very dangerous because you don't know whether or not that technology is being used for the good or for the bad. And so I think part of the notion of trying to be responsible and do the right thing with technology says we should not only be developing technology, but we should have an understanding of why we want to develop it, who is it going to impact, and what way is it going to impact them, is this something that if there are problems that come up, harms that come up, can we identify them? Can we try to mitigate them? Um, so there's a part of me that, you know, as a technologist, like I love programming. I love doing math. Um, I think it's great. But um, the doing that without examining why you're doing it, without examining what you're, what's the change you're trying to bring about, and trying to figure out what's the way that you can bring about some more good through doing what you're doing, is what that responsibility is about. And I think that permeates both the research side, it permeates the teaching side. Part of the reason to come back here actually to teach, I was in industry for about 10 years and had, I was, most of that time was spent at Google where you have access to a ton of resources, a ton of data, like thousands of machines, just you know, more resources than you actually have access to in academia. But part of the reason to come back here was actually all of you. Like you don't get to work with students in the same way. And that opportunity to do that, to be able to learn from other people, have hopefully try to have some impact in other people's lives was, was just profound. And that's, that's kind of been the guiding principle the whole time. Yeah, I'm interested in teasing out a little bit of, of what you just said in terms of the value judgments involved with technology as well. We're going to get to that um, soon. Um, but ju just before we get to that idea and how it relates to hum humans as well, just wanted to... Jack, if you Cool. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to perhaps sketch out for the audience a little bit better how AI works uh, as like in a nutshell, um, particularly for, for you, Max. Um, so there's a quote here from Jeffrey Hinton. Some people consider him the godfather of, of AI. I mean, we can talk about that as well. Um, but he says, there are two schools of thought in AI. Mainstream AI based its theories on reasoning and logic. We based our theories on the idea that connections between neurons change. And that's how you learn. And it turns out, in the long run, we came up trumps. So according to Hinton here, AI is based on how the human brain functions. That's your area of expertise, Max. Is that, is that even accurate at all? How far away is AI from actually how hum the human brain functions? Well, it started kind of in the 40s where the idea was, well, the brain has neurons, right? They're connected, and so let's try to do something with that. And uh, people then had to basically use logic gates, and you can show you can do all kinds of things with it. But the, the problem is it couldn't really learn anything, and that changed in the 50s, right? There was this idea of like Rosenblatt, and they, this, you can learn simple things, and you realize you put them together, you can do more and more complex things. <laughs> But uh, it's kind of at that level where uh, okay, you have neurons and then you hook them up to do complicated things. Um, but there's been a very fruitful interaction between AI and neuroscience. So uh, in terms of AI suggesting theories for how the brain could work, and then you do the neuroscience and see, well, does it actually work like that? And we know the brain doesn't learn the way uh, the, the deep networks do, like, like Jeff Hinton. I mean, he was one of the pioneers who developed this backpropagation algorithm that's kind of the bread and butter uh, was for a while. And um, uh, so that's been very fruitful, and uh, the, the current models are working a little differently than, than the brain works. Uh, so uh, <coughs> they're computationally 
uh, you're trying, you basically, it's motivated by the idea, idea of attention, that you can pay attention to certain things in your environment, and then you use that to try to predict something, but, it, but it's a very loose kind of motivation, and, um, uh, but they've been very successful, right? And so right now, I mean, this is, this is the victors, like saying, okay, here, we, we, we came out tops, but, uh, um, I mean, there's also, so the other camp is the symbolic camp, right? Then, uh, uh, where the idea was, well, like expert systems and things like that, I mean, you do, do logic, and, and there is room for that too. For instance, right now we speak, we use language, right? So we use, we use symbols to interact. And, uh, and so there might still be room for that. And some people even say, in the end, we're probably going to need both, right? Because as we're going to see, there's some limitations, right? And so these large language models uh, show us with one idea, how far can you get, right? And that tells us then, okay, well, what is missing uh, relative to human intelligence, right? So, 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 it's, so it's very interesting in terms of like saying, okay, here with one mechanism, that's kind of loosely inspired by how the brain works, see what we get, and then we can see uh, what, what do we not get, and then we can go from there. Awesome. Um, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on necessarily how AI works, um, so we can get to the, to the topic at, at hand, how it relates to humans as well, and so the audience have some time for questions. Uh, but I'll, I'll bring Mehran in the conversation uh, right now. Um, in 1986, the same Jeffrey Hinton, he came up with a language model. So capable of predicting the next word in a sentence out of a possible combination of 112 words, basically. It almost worked perfectly. There were a few, a few mistakes, but kind of worked. He said that today, computers can do that in a few seconds. According to him, the difference is just that we have more data and that more computational capacity. So with more data, bigger computers, AI got smarter. You think that is any, any possible obstacle in the future of AI can be solved with just more data, more computational capacity, including making AI human-like eventually? Um, I think it's an interesting question. I think the, the bigger question is what have we gotten out of AI, right? So we got all this data, we got compute, we put it in, we build these language models. Um, and I think the thing that we really got out of it was a big mirror in our face that said this is what you value. Right? And what I mean by that is when we build algorithms, for example, to make decisions about people. So in your lives these days, a ton of decisions are made for you by algorithms. Um, and they will continue to be when you go out into you know, the quote unquote real world outside the academy for those of you who are not already there. If you apply for a loan, chances are the decision is going to be made by an algorithm or a mortgage. Or if you're on dating apps right now, who actually shows up in your app is determined by an algorithm. Um, if you do things like you run in, have run-ins with the criminal justice system, whether or not you get bail will be determined by an algorithm. If you get access to health care, what access will be determined by an algorithm? Most people don't know that. Most of those systems are not actually audited to determine what kinds of decisions there's making. There's no requirement in most jurisdictions. A few jurisdictions have them, most of them don't. And what it's done in the last few years, why suddenly this thing around like ethics and fairness and all this stuff has come up is because AI put this big mirror in front of us that said, guess what? Your society is unjust. Your society is unfair. And I've learned from the data you gave me. So what are you going to do about it? So I think that's the big question for us. There are interesting questions where we think about in the future is are computers going to achieve like, you know, um, general artificial, like artificial general intelligence and what's that going to mean? I think we can talk about that and that's worthwhile. But I think in the here and now, what it's actually shown us is a lot of things in our world that previously um, we were not exposed to at the same level of exposure. Um, it's also created an opportunity. So it's not all bad. Part of having a mirror is understanding a little bit more about what you're actually seeing, what you're reflecting, and whether or not you want to change that. And so I think the question for us is, what do we want to change in our society that makes the data different, that makes the AI act in a way that we want it to act, right? Everyone says, like, there's this alignment problem. AI is not acting the way we want it to act. AI is acting the way we act. And if we don't like that, we need to think about how we act in order to think about what AI is going to do. Yeah, I mean, Maren, you've brought that up, you've, the idea of the, perhaps the objectivity of AI and how it's dependent on its creator, the computer scientist behind the code, and the data, who creates the data on which AI is based upon. I mean, I feel like that touches up upon something that the Max might, might help us out here as well, the idea of truth necessarily. How, how is AI different? What's the goal of AI? Is it to answer, it's problem solve? Is it to find truth? Is that, is that different 
from, from humans, essentially? It's great that Maron mentioned justice, right? Because, I mean, we've got to remember these systems are just trained to predict the next word, right? So uh, you look at the text you have, and it doesn't care about truth, it doesn't care about justice, it only cares about, okay, well, does the next word sort of kind of fit? And, uh, and so that's uh, very different from the idea of truth, right? So, um, so there's, and so the question is, is that human intelligence, right? I mean, is that, like, introspection is not the best guide, right? But, but is that how you live your lives, right? Do you think about, okay, what, what should I say next, right? What's the next word that fits, right? Um, so, <coughs> so this idea, uh, you might know the idea of an objective function, right? I mean, that's, so networks are trained to get better at something, right? And so the LLMs, the large language models, are all trained on, let's predict the next word based on a corpus of like billions and billions of documents, right? And, uh, and so um, that's great, but it, it doesn't care about truth. And so um, someone says, uh, um, so these LLMs are great at, um, excuse the term, I know Veritas form of, of bullshitting, right? So that, uh, so, <laughs> so, so because, I mean, if you, uh, if you lie, you still care about the truth, right? But uh, uh, LLMs just don't care about the truth at all. I mean, that, that's the idea of bullshitting. You just make something up, right, that you think fits. And, um, and that is not really, uh, doesn't really jibe with our idea of intelligence, right? That uh, um, it's kind of this, this idea that there's one thing that explains everything, right? And, uh, and so if that thing is written in the next word, right, it's kind of like this idea of, uh, uh, like, uh, we're, we evolve just so out of the fittest, right? I mean that, okay, there's uh, might makes right, right? The strongest survives. And uh, so there's, again, no concern for the truth, right? It's just, I do whatever makes me win. And so we see that uh, with, with some people, our, <laughs> our former president, for instance, right? Uh, like, I mean, it's, it's, or George Santos, right? I mean, the, if the idea is just to, just to win, right? You don't care about the truth, right? So, so there, there's one objective function, and here it's just, uh, to predict the next word. And so, so we see that kind of falls short of wha what we think intelligence is about, right? And, um, and, uh, and so, I mean, in, in Christianity, right, the idea is, okay, well, we, we follow someone who said, I am the truth, and, uh, um, uh, and, and that's already uh, helpful, right? But truth doesn't give you a purpose, right? So, so there needs to be something more. So these systems right now don't have a purpose, right? There's, uh, there's no telos, if you want to be fancy in Greek, right? And so, um, and the idea, like in, in Christianity as well, I mean, love your neighbor, right? Show other people what God is like. Um, and it's not might makes right. And, uh, and it's not, okay, let's just see what the next word is. Right? And so that's, I think, why these systems fall so far short. And so Moran, like, nicely pointed to, okay, they have no idea of justice, right? I mean, and, and then you try to kind of patch things up by providing some guardrails. But uh, the problem is, yeah, you have a trillion parameters in GPT-4, right? And, and you... Yeah, it's kind of whack-a-mole, right? You kind of fix some things and it pops out somewhere else, and that's because fundamentally it just is not a process that's really aimed at intelligence, but it's something else. I mean, if, if I'm trying to pull a little bit of devil's advocate here as well, is, I mean, today we don't have an, an AI that's able to search for truth that isn't impacted by its creator's value judgments, perhaps. Um, but, I mean, that's today, right? Is that an obstacle that you think is essential, the identity, like what AI is? Or is that something that could be overcome in the future, Marilyn? Well, I think AI is, in some sense, what we want it to be, right? And what it's been so far is the notion of we figure it out with a lot of compute and some fancy algorithms and basically a ton of data. The more data you pour into it, the more it exhibits intelligence. And it brings up this question is like, to what extent is that intelligence an illusion, like Max was referring to? I mean, the fact that it could hallucinate various kinds of things, um, or is is you know the reflection on us when people talk about you know artificial general, general intelligence is how intelligent are we, and how do we actually think about that intelligence, and what does it actually mean? Um, the notion of purpose, I think, is an important one, right? When you think about the question of is AI going to make us obsolete, for something to become obsolete, it means its purpose is replaced by something else or its purpose is no longer needed. And so I think it does raise that question, what is our purpose supposed to be and what do we want the purpose of an AI to be? So I think there's a lot of places where we, there's this thing for a while called narrow AI, which is rather than kind of going after the big question of general intelligence, you go after a bunch of application areas. And then it was more clear because you have a purpose. Like you want the AI to like filter your spam email or you want the AI to do something like make an appointment for you. There's a clear purpose there. If there isn't a clear purpose, then we need to ask the question, what is this endeavor we're going after? And it's kind of the mirror back on us. It kind of raises the question, what is your purpose as a human being?
Uh, just, just to add to the values, like there's philosopher Thomas Nagel at, uh, at NYU who's, who's, who's an atheist, but uh, he said, well, values are really not something that's part of uh, like the physical world. It's kind of, kind of something that's separate, right? This idea, okay, what is, what is good, what is bad? And, uh, <clears throat> and so that makes it really hard then to, to train a system to say good and bad. I mean, you can, so right now, chat GDP is just, uh, GDP is just trained up with a lot of documents, right? And that's, and that's kind of concerning because you don't know what, what the corpus is. And uh, just the CEO of OpenAI just last week, Congress said, well, we're not going to tell you what, what documents we train our system on. Right? And, uh, and so, but if your ethics derive from documents, that's kind of a scary thing, right? Because uh, think about if you train in the Third Reich, right? Then it might think yeah, exterminating the Jews is a great idea, right? And so it's really, the, the problem is there's a lot of um, uh, lack of clarity in terms of like, I mean, you just learn your ethics from a blank slate, right? And then it's just based on text and what, ChatGPT doesn't care about if, if you talk about murder or if you talk about a cooking recipe, right? It's, it's all just predicting things. And so the idea is, well, we humans do care about like what's good, what's bad, right? We have this idea of values, even universal human values, right? I mean, child abuse is bad no matter what, right? And, uh, uh, and that's something, it's really an open question whether you can get, train these systems uh, to have the sense of value because it might be something you just, you just can't program on. I mean, we've, we've touched on a little bit the idea of truth and bringing in distinctive elements of human experience. There's something as well that you both have touched on, the idea of language, how AI and large language models as well um, are able to predict the next word in a sentence. They're based on human language, the data that it collects, the data that it generates. It's all about language. There's a recent speech from Yuval Harari that he gave in the Frontier Forums. He said that AI, by understand, by generating, by collecting human language, it has just hacked the operating system of human civilization. So we've, we've talked about all the other elements of human experience, but language seems to strike right at the core of it. You don't, uh, this, this is for Marin specifically, you don't think that the capabilities for AI to generate language similar to humans is something that perhaps draws it the closest to being, to, to being human-like. Um, in some ways, I think it does, but it, it rests on an illusion. And the illusion that it rests on is the fact that we ascribe meaning to language ourselves. So if you want a human being to ascribe intelligence to something, why not communicate in human language with the person? Because what the person's going to do is no matter what the words were, what you meant by the words, they're going to ascribe their own meaning to those words, right? Well, this happens between two human beings all the time, where someone says something and someone else misunderstands it, right? But we, we do sense making ourselves. We get a bunch of symbols, whether that be written symbols or spoken symbols, which are words, right? Whatever the case may be. And then in our head, we make some meaning of that. And so part of the illusion of a system like G chat GPT or GPT-4 is that it communicates, uh, communicates with us in the symbols that we ascribe meaning to, which means we can ascribe much more meaning to those symbols or what that communication is than what's actually meant by the communication, which is basically statistically trying to determine probabilities of next words and generating those words modulo, a bunch of like other fancy training you do to try to get things that are more palatable to human beings. And so I think from Harari's standpoint, the, the hacking that's happening is are, it, it, is, it is a hacking in some sense, but it is relying on us to make meaning of what those symbols are, rather than dissecting what was actually meant by those symbols by the system that generated them. Right. Max, what do you think of that assessment, in terms of the relationship between AI, how it uses human language, and perhaps how it's still dependent on the computer scientists behind it, the people who have generated the language beforehand. Yeah, I think Miran is right on. Uh, I mean, it just, you, I mean, if you take any computer science class, like you do Hello World, right? And, uh, and out comes Hello World. It doesn't mean the computer likes to interact with you, right? Um, and, and, so, and so it's just, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, or like, I mean, back in the day, the Mac had this, like, happy Mac when it booted up right, or it had a sad Mac when, when something didn't work out. And then you think, oh, my computer's happy or sad? Right? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's just like, using the fact that, yeah, we communicate in language, right, and we kind of think there must be intelligence behind it, but, uh, I mean, because the nice thing is that we can open up the box, right, and there, it's just predicting the next word, and so this is really interesting because then we see how far we can get without really, if you want, understanding anything, um, 
And uh, then we can see, yeah, where do we fall short? And we now see, okay, you can do a lot of things, but there's some things that don't work so well. So I think it's uh, right up. Yeah. Um, so the, the question today is, will AI make us obsolete? Um, and we're touching on both the promises and the perils of AI. You know, how it can help us in the future, how it can harm us or be perhaps terrifying to other human beings eventually in the future. Um, and, um, and so, so there's, there's a quote from Eliezer Yudkovsky. Uh, he wrote in Time magazine. He said, if, if somebody builds a too powerful AI under present conditions, I expect that every single member of the human species and all biological life on Earth <laughs> dies shortly thereafter. Um, not very optimistic person, this, this guy. <laughs> um, but the question that we have today in terms of will AI make us obsolete? It's not like Merrim pointed out, you know, to make, us op to make something obsolete, it's got to replace it, it's got to be, it doesn't have to be useful anymore. So we've touched on perhaps if AI becomes human-like, that's one of the spheres in which it can make humans obsolete. But that's not, that's not the only way in which AI can make us obsolete um, as well. I mean, we can look at AI exemplifying di and fulfilling different functions that humans have so far performed in society. So perhaps not as extreme as Yudkovsky, you still think that these advances in AI uh, in terms of replacing a few activities that humans have done can eventually lead to the, to the death of human civilization as we know it. Miriam. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a nice light question for this evening. <laughs> Go um, for it. I mean, I think the, we have much bigger issues, right? The notion of we actually have a technology that could have ended humanity and all life on the planet. It's called nuclear weaponry. We've lived with it for 70 years. We've done the best we can to not actually use those weapons, right? But I would be much more terrified of a computer that was hooked up to a nuclear silo than I would be right now of AI or building something that we believe we think of as some generally intelligent uh, apparatus. Um, I think you know, it comes down to the question of what are the capabilities that we actually ascribe to it, right? And what kinds of affordances, what kind of actions it can take in the world. It's one thing when the actions you can take in the world are you type in some text or you type in a prompt and it gives you back some text. Um, one of the things actually at the, the most recent TED, um, uh, there was a talk by Greg Brockman there from OpenAI that was actually one of the things that, you know, it went across as, wow, this is really neat. And there was a part of me that got like a chill down my spine when I saw it, which was they hooked up OpenAI to be able to make API calls to other systems. And I was like, that's really neat when the system you're calling is like a calculator or is like, you know, Wolfram Alpha and it can like solve some integral or whatever but I worry about how far you want to push the system in terms of the kinds of other systems that can interact with. Because when you do that, what you're doing is increasing its capability, and some of those capabilities mean taking action in the physical world. And when you allow that to happen, that's the place I get worried. Because if one of those APIs that you can call is NORAD, then I'm really worried about the AI. But if the API you can call is some API to draw images on your screen, I'm not so worried. The question of what we hook it up to right now is not a question of what the AI does. It's a question of what we do. And that's the place I think we need to be really deliberate rather than saying like, hey, this technology is cool. Let's go hook it up to A and B and C. Is we need to say, why does this thing need to be hooked up to A and B and C? What's the purpose? What do we hope to get out of it? And take a real sober assessment to those questions before we just hook it up because it makes a neat demo. So, yeah, I mean, Max, Maren's saying here that, I mean, AI is, Again, it's, it's about the, the person behind the computer that decides its future. Um, is that a fair assessment? Is, is, is it ultimately up to us? And if it is, how can we better deal with AI from now yeah. and into the near future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it makes a good headlines to say this is going to be, you know, we should all head to the hills or get to the basement and lift off canned, canned food for now, right? Because we're all going to go down, right? But, uh, uh, I mean, it, it is a tool, right? Uh, and, uh, and and the problem is if you see it as more than that, right? I mean, it's uh, it's kind of like an autocomplete, if you want. And uh, <clears throat> and if you use it in a way that you can assess the output and see, okay, is is that good or, or bad? Is it useful or not? Then then I think that's a good. So uh, my my daughter, for instance, applied for a job at Chick Fil A, and um, 
Uh, and uh, she used ChatGPT to write a cover letter, and, uh, she, <laughs> and she said, well, write a cover letter for like, uh, a, a girl who has like, uh, four siblings and who cares a lot and wants to work at Chick-fil-A, and out came a wonderful cover letter to talk about the fast-paced business environment and whatnot, and the hiring manager said, oh, that was a great letter. And, <laughs> and, and, so, and so those are good examples, right? I mean, because you can assess if it's, if it's bullshit or not, right? But, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the problem is if y you go beyond that, right, and you take it as, as the gospel or like something you don't know about, and then, and then there, there are issues, right? Because uh, like right now we do Google search, you get like 10 links, right? You look at all of them, right? And kind of form your own opinion, right? Whereas ChatGPT gives you one answer. And then, well, what happened to like diversity and whatnot, right? I mean, it's just you have this one answer and you, you, uh, you got to go with it. And so, um, and uh, I mean, there are other issues. Like if you think this is, this is a person I'm talking to, it's, it's like a person, right? And there's a company like Replica, right? Who offers chatbots like as uh, romantic partners. Right? And, uh, and, and the problem with that is that, uh, uh, I mean, there's a loneliness epidemic, right? I mean, just last week, right? The uh, Surgeon General declared a loneliness epidemic, right? People are, people are very lonely. And so that might help. But the problem is then if you think this is how real people are, right? Then there's a real danger because you, uh, then uh, you, you might prefer a chatbot who always agrees with you, tells you how awesome you are, right? And, uh, and, and then you interact with the real world, and there are people who might not always tell you how awesome you are, right? And, then, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and so, so, so that's a problem. So, so I think it's really like thinking about what should we use it for and what not. Like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, like Europe is talking about, like, uh, okay, let's not use AI for social scoring, for instance, right? Or crime prediction at the individual level and things like that. And so, but other, like, like Moran said, I mean, others, like, I mean, if you just want to see, okay, well, where should we order food tonight, then sure. I mean, or like write the cover letter, I mean, the road stuff, then that's, that's, that's great. So it can be a tool, but yeah, we just can't uh, like be naive and think, okay, this is now human intelligence or whatnot, but uh, it has its limitations and we got to understand what these limitations are. So, I mean, Max, it seems like you're talking about the increased connectedness, perhaps is one of the biggest dangers of AI. You know, humans, being dependent on it for relationships, for everyday activities, for work, for everything. And that's perhaps one of the ways in which AI can, can make us obsolete as well. What do you think of, what do you think of that, Maren? Um, I mean, I think it, could, it has the potential to do a lot of wonderful things, right? I mean, it has, um, I, mean, I don't know if this is true or not. You can probably tell me. I have a sense that like 20-year-olds are dating a lot more now than they were when I was 20. That could just be more of a statement about me. Um, <laughs> but I get the sense that technology has actually broadened people's social horizons. It's created both affordances to connect with other people, ways to try to find people that are more compatible. So there's things where we've said, like, this might actually be a socially useful thing. Um, but at the same time, so that helps increase connectedness. But part of what we also need to think about is what does connectedness actually mean for us? What is the value of connectedness? What is the depth of connectedness? Um, I'll give you a simple example, which is, you know, many of you are probably on social media. I'm going to date myself because I'm on Facebook, which is, or meta as it's called these days, which means I'm old now. Um, but, you know, the notion is that if I interact with other people on that platform, somehow I'm increasing connectedness, right? And their, their stated mission is to connect the world. Um, and what we've found is that, you know, it's not that necessarily having a link to someone that you claim is a friend online is actually connecting the world because there's a lot of things where people post inflammatory content, they po post false and misleading content in terms of the things that the company's measuring like time on platform, click through rates, number of people who are interacting with those pieces of content, right? All those measures are up. That doesn't necessarily mean the world's more connected. And so what we really need to think about is what do we want out of a connection? Is that a connection that technology can foster? In some cases, I think it is. In some cases, AI can help with that. How do we want to create those connections in a way that's healthy? And can we build systems to do that? Right? And that may not be a system that maximizes ad revenue. It might be a system that requires a different level of understanding as to what we want human interaction to be. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to end on a negative note <laughs> in terms of how, I mean, this, this code is pretty negative. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to briefly perhaps sketch out the promises of AI. And I think you've both, both touched on that in this conversation. You know, Marin, you talked about how AI can be a mirror for us to perhaps understand our, ourselves better. You know, uh, perhaps an easy example is that to define fairness, there are like 
20 different mathematical formulas. And, and that's going to be up to, up to the computer scientists behind the computer to, to decide that, to determine what kind of morality or ethics the AI tool is going to behave under, is going to uh, acquire. Um, is, that, is that one of the ways in which AI can be promising for us? Is to understanding ourselves better, better sketching out our sense of morality and what's right and wrong? Absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that. I think that's one of the, the real promises is the fact that, like, when people make biased decisions, you can't ethically cut someone's head open. And maybe, I mean, you probably understand this better than I do, but I would imagine you can't come and set, cut someone's head open, look at their brain, and be like, there's where the bias is. Like, it's those, those neurons right there. Um, Whereas with algorithms, I mean, they might have trillions of parameters, but there's a bunch of things we can do to actually do measurements, do tests, and assess is the, are the results we're getting the kind of results we want to have. Like, are we finding bias if we look at the output of the algorithm across different genders or across different races or whatever, you know, whatever thing we want to measure? That's something we can measure from algorithms. It's something that we can potentially try to mitigate. And we need to have the strength to realize that in some cases where we cannot mitigate it, the answer is not to use an algorithm. It is hard to do that when you are working at a company or in some situation where there is millions of dollars of investment behind some algorithm. And you assess it and you say, this thing is biased and we shouldn't use it. That's the place where I think when we deal with questions of technology and we think about questions of ethics, there are questions of courage. There are questions of are you willing to do the right thing even if it might have a negative impact on your career? What is the right thing to do? What are the values you want to uphold? And I think the, the days of saying I'm just a technologist, I just build this stuff and someone else worries about those questions are far over. Right? And that's one of the things we have to grapple with. As technologists, every day we will make questions that are, make decisions that are value laden, that are ethically laden. And if we're kind of asleep at the wheel when we do that, we're going to get what we don't know we're getting because we're not answering those questions before we go and build it. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, yeah, so, but yeah, if, if you want to end on the positive note, yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a warning for us to be vigilant and not naive, right, realizing these systems don't care about the truth, don't really have values like, like people do. But, uh, I mean, AI has been very uh, helpful, like, it's going you know, to send the brain, right, because it gives you a way to say, okay, well, I think the brain learns that way, you implement it, and uh, you see does it work or not. And, uh, like, if you might remember AlphaGo, like, a while ago, and that combined, like, deep learning, reinforcement learning, so, so different AI techniques that were then also modeled in terms of how the brain might learn, how the brain might learn new skills. And so it's been very fruitful, the interaction. <coughs> and uh, it's, it's helpful to analyze, like when we do brain imaging experiments, like each experiment produces gigabytes of data. And then, uh, well, how do you sift through it? And, and, and that's helpful. And now as we move to, for instance, deep brain stimulation and closed loop systems. So uh, you have people with major depression that uh, um, don't respond to medication and uh, uh, I mean, can't get out of bed. And so, so, so what do you do? And, uh, there's been very exciting work, uh, actually, down the road, at least somewhere, at, at, so at UCSF, right? But so, uh, and, and other places also, where you record from parts of the brain where, and then train a classifier to predict, is the person going to have a depressive episode? And then you stimulate another part of the brain uh, to uh, uh, terminate this episode. And it's, uh, so it's a closed loop system. There's a classifier that decides, should I stimulate or not? And, um, uh, and it works amazingly well, uh, and so so people uh, so uh, go in, go into remission. But the the question, of course, is then, and that's where the worldview comes in again. I mean, how do you want people to feel? Right? Do you want them to be happy all the time? Uh, probably not, right? Because if you're just happy, I mean, you got to engage with the real world, right? And this world is a messy place. It's messed up, right? And so uh, and so you want to be uh, at that sweet spot where you f you realize, okay, this is things aren't the way they should be, but um, that you're enabled to take action, right? And so, so the interesting questions, again, were how do we use this for the best of the individual, for the best of society? Um, but there's great promise in, in AI. I mean, really, really, there, there's a, there are amazing things going on. Um, but yeah, we, we just can't be naive about uh, how we're going to use it and also what the implications are. Actually, I have, I have a quick question to start out with. So I, I, I understand, so I'm a philosophy major, as you can tell with my technical difficulties. <laughs> um, 
how, how ethical do, do we think the, the average computer scientist is? Is, is the computer scientist a, a, a mensch that's, that's concerned with, with the implications of, of technology? Or what, what would be the advice for a room full of computer scientists uh, that either one of you would, would give that's going to be working on groundbreaking developments in artificial technology or artificial intelligence? You want to, you're going to say you want to start? <laughs> oh, I can start. But <laughs> I mean, you're, you're the one that's teaching ethics, but so, so maybe I can do the simple things first. And then, uh, so, well, well, I think it's very important to consider the ethical perspectives, right, because the system is so much more powerful than it used to be. And so, and uh, now you can, like Maran said, right, I mean, you can apply them to all kinds of questions um, where it's very tempting to uh, say, oh, look, I can predict this, right? I can predict credit worthiness, right? I, I, I can predict... Uh, well, and people have been doing that, right? I mean, how likely is that person going to commit a crime or something like that? And so, so right now, it's the technology kind of outpacing uh, or requiring us to really think about, do we want to do this, right? And, and wh what are the pitfalls? And so I think it's very important now. I mean, it's the same thing with neuroscience as we get to now questions that really get at the self, right? To think about uh, what are the implications here? And like Ron said, I mean, sh should we be doing this um, or, or not? Yeah, I mean, I'd very much agree with Max. I think part of the issue is that your, your responsibility is commensurate with your power. And one of the things about being a technologist is you have immense power tools at your disposal, which means you have immense responsibility in terms of using those power tools. Um, by and large, I don't think like technologists are any worse equipped or better equipped than like the average person in terms of making ethical judgments and making value judgments. I think by and large, most people want to be good people. They want to do the right thing. Um, the real question is, how do you measure the right thing? How do you know that you're doing something that's aligned with your values? And I think for a long time, we developed technology without asking the question, is this thing aligned with my values? Right? And it's a very simple question, but it's a question that's easy to ignore when you're enamored by the technology. Um, and if you're, I don't know if you like watching documentaries. I love documentaries, actually. And there's this amazing documentary uh, called The Day After Trinity, and it's about the development of the atomic bomb. And one of the things they go through is like a lot of the people who were involved in the endeavor of building nuclear weapons uh, early on actually became peace activists because they realized the immense responsibilities they had. But one of the lines I love in the movie is, uh, I think it's uh, Freeman Dyson says, there's this technical arrogance to realizing you can move a billion tons of rock with your mind. And when you realize you have that kind of power, it's hard not to get intoxicated by the power. It's hard to say, you know what? I can build these models that can fool people into thinking they're intelligent. I can build a model that generates a billion dollars of revenue every month because it optimizes the ads that people get shown. Right? It is hard to not feel that power. But part of feeling that power is also understanding there's a responsibility that comes with that power to understand what is the impact you're having in the world with this technology. It is something more than just generating revenue. It is something more than just fooling people into thinking something is intelligent, right? And taking time to really assess that, I think, is the important thing. And then making the hard decision, like, does this align with your values? Is the impact that this is actually having on our society something that you want to see in the world or not? Um, that's the responsibility. But I think the reason why you have great responsibility is you have great power as, as technologists. And so just, just to build off of that, I think it's also then important to think about, okay, what are your values, right? I mean, what's your worldview? Why do you get up in the, I mean, what do you think is your ultimate goal here, right? And, uh, and so this being the Veritas Forum, right? I, I think this is really uh, important. Yeah, you have the responsibility, but then to think about, okay, well, what, what kind of place do you want the world to be like, right? And uh, uh, what is the ultimate purpose here? And I think one of the questions we have here actually touches on that, responsibility of, of the technologist. Um, someone asked, how do you see AI affecting unemployment rates? Hmm. Do uh, it's certainly going to affect unemployment rates. It's just going to affect it very differentially in different parts of the labor market. Um, that's the thing we need to be aware of. There are some parts of the labor market that will get impacted more than other parts of the labor market. Let me give you a simple example. About 9% of the U.S. population, working population, is involved in the transportation industry in some sense or not. Okay. So if you think about autonomous vehicles or autonomous trucking or autonomous planes, um, that's going to have some impact on what happens with employment rates in the transportation sector, and which is a non-trivial fraction of a lot of employment in the country. The question is, what do we do about it? 
right? AI is also going to create opportunities. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to become a prompt engineer now, which seems to be kind of the hot thing. It's like, that's going to be the new job. It's like, <laughs> eh, there's going to be some people who will be prompt engineers. It will not be 9% of the population in the United States. So what do we do, right? And this is, not, this is one of those things to understand, is that the solution to technology problems is not always more technology. Sometimes the solution is to say, there are certain sectors of the labor market that we see are going to be impacted more. What we should be doing is creating educational and reskilling programs that are geared with the right set of incentives for that part of the labor force so they can be trained in advance before some of those jobs actually become obsolete or there's underemployment for them to move into other areas. Right? This stuff isn't rocket science. It's a question of will. It's a question of collective action that says, what do we want to demand in terms of the change we want to see to account for what we actually see coming down the road? And so as technologists, we have some reasonable ideas to some of the things that are coming down the road. It behooves us to get involved in things like social and political processes to help actually guide some of the outcomes that we'd like to see. And it gets back to what Max said. What are your values? What do you want to see in the world? We want to, you want to? No, that sounds cool. Good. Awesome. Um, another question we have, I know that we're seeing it as up to us, what we do with AI, where we hook it up, where we hook it up to. But what if AI algorithms start interacting with themselves? What if they work with each other and humans can no longer control them anymore or predict their next move? Is this possible? Do you think this could happen? <laughs> it's like in uh, War Games that 79 flicked with uh, who, who, who? Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick. No <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to play thermonuclear war? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it would just be foolish, right? I mean, like we, we just talked about the shortcomings of uh, AI systems in terms of uh, as, as like intelligent uh, uh, agents, right? Again, no concern for the truth, la la la, la right? No, no values. And so we're very foolish then to let, I mean, it's not like you let a two-year-old, like, uh, uh, I know, drive your car, right? It's just, uh, I mean, <laughs> we, uh, we need to understand what the limitations are and then see, okay, what are areas where we can use it responsibly and which are areas that we, that we shouldn't uh, uh, use it in. But the, like Moran pointed out, right, the, uh, just because it uses language, right, does not mean it's intelligent. And, uh, and, and that's something we have to keep in mind. Um, another question. I think there's something missing from modern life due to the lack of religion in mainstream life. How will AI affect modern views on religion? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's very helpful because it helps us see, um, okay, if you just have a computer program, right, what, what does it not have, right? And, uh, and so we talked about the lack of purpose, for instance, right? And we talked about... Um, it don't care about the truth, it doesn't have any feelings, right? I mean, just because the computer sa says I'm sad doesn't mean it's sad, right? And uh, there's, no, there's no consciousness, right? There's no, there's no feeling of self. And, uh, and so I think it's very helpful because we realize, uh, okay, there's more to the human existence. And so, uh, and then the question is, well, um, now what are you going to do with that, right? That we find there's this, this shortcoming. And so I think it's going to be helpful as people see Okay, this, this is not it, right? and, uh, and then, okay, what else is there? Well, how are people different, right? And how do we account for that? Right? And, uh, and like I said in the beginning, like thinking, okay, this, it's all the material world, doesn't really account for the human experience, right? It's much broader than that, uh, thankfully though, uh, thankfully so, and so that should make us think. Right? And then uh, where do we go from there? What, what makes sense of uh, the richness of how people are, right? And so I think AI is very helpful. It's this one idea, it, but it shows us where it falls short and that people are more than that. Um, top voted question coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Drum roll. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Marin brought up the point that LLMs work via the illusion of language. It uses symbols to which we ascribe meaning without meaning. Can AI ever get to the point where it means what it says? What would that even look like? Is it even possible? If it happens, would we be able to tell? I think it's an interesting question because it raises the question of what does it mean for us to understand language? And then it, there's these, all these questions about how we ascribe meaning to things or the things that I ascribe meaning to the same way that you ascribe meaning to things. Um, there's this famous you know, historical philosophical example as many of you have probably heard of called the Chinese Room that John Searle, who's a philosopher at Berkeley, came up with which was the notion that, how many people have heard of the Chinese room? 
We got a few. Okay, so less than I expected. So let me tell you what it is. Basic idea is there's a room where uh, uh, you're in this room basically, and there's the uh, book there, and what's what gets slid under the door every day is a sheet of paper with a bunch of symbols on it that you don't know what those symbols are. But what you do is you have this book in the room, and it turns out you can open up the book, and there will be a page in the book that the symbols on that page exactly match the symbols on the sheet of that was slid under the door. And on the facing page, there's a bunch of symbols. And so your job is basically to just copy down everything on that facing page and slide it out of the room. So this is what you do on a daily basis. You get your sheet, you find the thing in the book, you copy down some symbols, you slide it out. So there's people standing outside the room, and what's actually going on outside the room is people are writing questions in Chinese, sliding them into the room, and getting back the correct answers to those questions written in Chinese. And so the question is, does the room understand Chinese? Right? And this is kind of this philosophical problem. Some people say, well, the room doesn't understand Chinese because the mechanism that's inside the room, namely the thing copying down the symbols, doesn't actually understand Chinese. That's kind of the intention. There's no intent behind the understanding. The, there's an extensional stance that says, the, for the people outside the room, the room understands Chinese. They're writing questions in Chinese. They're getting the answers. And so it's a matter of how you want to view the world, right? You could say that's kind of what AI is, or potentially that's what the human mind is. We like to ascribe some notion of deep meaning. Are we really just doing symbol matching with language? And that's really what's going on in our head under some illusion that we're ascribing more meaning to it. Or is there something deeper? And if there is that something deeper, then that's in your wheelhouse, because I'm not a neuroscientist. There's something going on in your brain that creates that meaning for us, right? Whatever, if there is something that does that, that has some structure associated with it, why couldn't we recreate that structure in silicon as opposed to protein? And then it gets into the question of like, is it just a physical structure or is there something else? No, I think it's a fascinating question. Uh, this, uh, and so some people say, well, you have to ground it in, in the physical world because that's the basis that we have. That's why truth is so important, right? Because that's one basis that we all can interact with because otherwise we're off in our own worlds, right? And, uh, but the Chinese room is interesting because uh, um, it, if you ask the room the question, how many questions have I asked you today? It wouldn't be able to do that, right? And so, and so I think like, like the same thing with LLMs, that there are limits in terms of its reasoning that we already know from the algorithm, right? The paper just came out last week, uh, like Gubek et al, showing that, uh, well, LMs have big problems with like um, problems where you can't do sequential reasoning, but you have to go back. Like they had this one example of like a poem where you require the last line is the reverse of the first line, and uh, uh, GB4 did poorly at it, and, and it's because you just have the sequential reasoning, whereas we humans can go back and forth, right? And you can say, well, there are some limits right now in uh, how LLMs can reason and how we humans reason, and, uh, and also what the Chinese room could, uh, couldn't reason. And that's interesting questions like, is it just a quantitative problem? Like, okay, we implement this little hack that now we can do, we can go back and forth in our reasoning, and then we get human intelligence, right? But, uh, but then there are other parts like this, this grounding, this idea of truth or so that might be a lot harder because you, you, you can't program them. And, uh, and so that's why I'm saying it's interesting to see what can we patch up and then what, what is left there. And that tells us, okay, um, there might be something beyond uh, just an algorithm. I mean, we have a new top-loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> There's always going to be a new top-loaded question. Um, there's been a lot of talk about ChatGPT abs abstracting thought away from education, killing the essay and other development of critical thinking skills. Do you think this is a significant risk, or will AI democratize education in the same way that the internet has to some extent? I'm not going to touch the question of whether the internet has democratized education, <laughs> but let's just, let's just pretend it has. Um, but their question around AI, I think, is, a, is an important one. And I think what it gets into is not so much the question of AI itself, but the question of what is the educational process. And so the way I think about it is the way we traditionally do a lot of education is we focus on product. And what I mean by focusing on product, which is a weird way to think about education, is I want you to understand something, say, about the Civil War. So what I ask you is to write me an essay about what were the causes of the Civil War and what was the outcome. My expectation in doing that is that I want you to research ideas about the Civil War. I want you to go through the thought process of how to put these ideas together, actually create something coherent, organize it, and write it all out. And my assumption is that all of that happened when you turn in this essay about the Civil War. 
Now, the truth is, in some cases it does, and in some cases it doesn't. In some cases, kids go to the encyclopedia, or they go in the old days, or they go to the internet, and they just copy something down that they find on the internet. They ask their friend, hey, what did you write on your essay? Or sometimes, you know, as happens, I won't get into honor code issues, but like, hey, did you do that assignment last quarter? Can I take a look at what you did? Um, if you want to get really insidious, there are actually uh, websites where you go and you say, here's my assignment, will you solve it for me? And for like $50 or $100, someone will. Right? So there's lots of ways to produce that product. And in, traditionally in education, we've just made the assumption that if you make the product, you are going through the educational process. I think chat GPT and things like it, large language models, what they do is they say, now we make short-circuiting that process to get to product much easier. So it's something that more people might be enticed to do. So if we still care about the actual education happens not because you turn in an essay at the end, it's all the stuff you did to actually get to the essay. It's about the process. How do we actually assess process in education? Because if we could do that, we can think about ways that we get people to go through the process of learning the things we want them to learn. The th way we assess them may not be the final product they produce. That's kind of, and I think that, I don't say that as kind of a simple pithy kind of thing. I think that is a deep rethinking of how we do the educational process and how much resource it takes to do the educational process. Um, but that's kind of how I think about it now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it might, like there was the, uh, like a few years ago, the, the people on the Google effect, right? I mean, the fact that you could just uh, uh, search for things, how, changing the way we think that we don't, uh, uh, so much think about okay what the information is, but rather okay I can look this up and then uh, we we can run with that and uh, <coughs> and so there's probably going to be an effect of like using Chat GPT um, again and there and there are a lot more pitfalls there because again it can confabulate and things like that uh, but uh, but I think then it's it's on us as educators to think about okay well um, how can we then get around this I mean there's there's a lot of positive effects of, of AI, right, in, in education, right, you can much more individualize teaching and things like that and keep, keep track of where, where people are and what they have to work on rather than having like one size fits all. Um, but, uh, but I think yeah, it's, it's upon us to think about, well, given chat GPT, like, like you said, I mean, there, there, there are always ways to, there have been ways to cheat like since uh, time immemorial, right, but uh, then how can we sh make sure that uh, uh, even if people are tempted to do this, in the end, there's going to be an assessment where uh, they need to have worked through it. It's like problem sets, right? Um, <laughs> uh, if you don't do the problem sets, you're gonna have a big, uh, uh, you have a very hard time with the final exam, right? Um, uh, great advice, right? So, so, and you can try to get to the problem sets by some other way, but then in the end, the final exam, you're gonna have a problem. And so I think it's uh, then for us to make assessments that uh, um, even though there's a temptation to realize in the end, there's just no shortcut to really understanding the material yourself. Yeah, we're going to do one more question. Let's drop a bomb and leave for Max. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you place so much weight on truth when 40% of Americans believe falsehoods solely for religious reasons? Like that the, <laughs> that the earth is 6,000 6, years old, that gays are sinners, et cetera. <laughs> well, that's, that's a great question because we, because we really care about the truth, right? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be a Christian if I didn't think it has the best answers, right? It's, I don't get any brownie points for being Christian. Um, and so I think it's, uh, um, so everyone has a worldview, right? So the, the question is, like, what is yours? You might say, well, I only believe in, uh, like, scientific statements, but that statement itself is not scientific, right? So the thing kind of kind of collapses, right? So, so I mean, there, uh, it's, so as a scientist, right, I mean, I find that Christianity is actually a great basis because, um, as I said, like if we think it's just a relative of the fittest, then our whole cognitive apparatus wouldn't be set up to find out the truth, right? It's all just, okay, I care about surviving. And then you, you can actually show that then having a system that lets you do true reasoning is not something that falls out of that, right? I mean, there, you can, uh, you can uh, basically do, do the simulation, right? So, so the fact that there's a creator who created us with, uh, in his image, right, with, with a mind, right, is for me like a starting point to say, okay, now we can actually do science, right, because here's someone who created this world in, in a lawful way, right, and, um, <coughs> and uh, now we can see how awesome it is, right. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there are people, uh, so it's, uh, 
like the Earth is six thousand years old. Well, there there are disagreements, right? And uh, uh, I don't believe it, right? It's uh, I mean, there's there's good scientific evidence that it's much older than that. It's also not something that the Bible says six thousand years old. People basically count generations and then come up with uh, okay, we think six thousand years old. And those are things you want to debate, right? Because uh, uh, in the end, we want to figure out what's really true, right? Because, uh, again, truth matters, right? Not just for this life, but maybe also for life to come, right? I mean, you really got to be sure you get this right. And, uh, and uh, that's why I'm a scientist, but that's also why I'm a Christian, right? And for every one of you guys, right? I mean, it's the, like, if you just say you're a materialist, you don't believe any of that religion stuff, right? Then the question is, on what basis, right? I mean, how can you rule out there's nothing else? Have you looked everywhere? Have you been to Pluto, right? So, I mean, just being farcical here, but, but it, it's really... Like, think about what are the assumptions of your worldview and how justified are they? And do they make sense of your human experience, right? Do they make sense of the fact that you feel that you think you have free will, right? That, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And it's so important to get this right. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, this is where I am right now in terms of, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't justify, I mean, Christianity is, I mean, the idea is really that you're supposed to love people, right? You even love your enemies. Right? And, uh, and so I don't, there's, it's, if you look at Jesus, right, he hung out with the prostitutes and whatnot, right? And, and I mean, this is really, you want to show people what, what God is like. And, uh, and, and so there's no room for hate, not at all. And, uh, and so there are people who then pervert this teaching, right? But I mean, then you can go through, if you say you're a Christian, we can go to the Bible, we, we can go through it, right? But in the end, I find it to be the most satisfying answer for how this world works and also how we deal with how messy it is. Right? I mean, that here, this world needs more love, right? And then I can do that, I can love other, I don't care about being the fittest, right? Because I know God's got my back, and that sets me free to love people. And uh, I think it's just a great philosophy.